I don't know, Marty, we're back. Do you think we're live? I can never tell if we're live. I think we're live, and we're live with uh, Pei Lu. Hey, hey Lu. What up, dog? What up? Listen, okay, I want a name. <laughs> I want a name like Pei Lu because you can reduce your entire name to just one. You were Pei Lu Tran, yeah. but we could just call you Pei Lu like, like the soccer player or like Madonna, you know, like I'm Z-Dog, but not really. Have you ever thought about just getting rid of the last name entirely? Pei Lu. I, I feel like I need to be much, much, much more famous. <laughs> And then, and then I can get like the little C next to uh, the bottom right of my name. Well, you're about to be famous here. Yeah. You're about to get the Z-Dog bump. You're going to get, yeah, the Z-Dog bump, which is actually a negative bump. So actually, however many followers you had on Twitter or whatever, they start to go away. But you know, for people who don't know, and I always intro this on the audio podcast separately, but for the video guys, mm-hmm. people who don't know who this guy is, how you, you connected with this guy and Marty was like, Z-Dog, you got to interview Pelu. And I'm like, Marty, what do you mean? 1.21 gigawatts. I've always wanted to say that because your name is Marty, because Marty McFly. But you told me this this guy who's a Stanford medical student for the last 10 years. I mean, to be a medical student for 10 years, I could hardly handle it for four. I wanted to die. He's done it for 10, has started two companies, is changing the way we think about medical errors. And the thing is, the way we think about medical errors is we're in denial about it. Yeah, oh, we're trying to kind of beat ourselves up and, you know, this number's wrong and here's the, a better estimate than your estimate and we play these academic games and it's like, look, people are getting hurt. Doesn't matter if it's the third leading cause of death or fourth leading cause of death, as the <laughs> IOM suggested, or the ninth leading cause of death, people are getting hurt out there. Yeah, I don't understand this distinction between people are upset as, oh, it's not really the third leading cause of death, it's the ninth leading cause of death. Okay, <laughs> we are killing <clears throat> patience because we're not accepting the fact that we're human and we make errors we beat ourselves up we're scared of malpractice we're highly competitive individuals and then this kid from stanford shows up with an engineering degree started his first company augmetics like 20 million dollar plus company i forget how much t- t- tell me we, we i think we raised over 70 million at the time that i i started Ferrum. So, and uh, Augmetics was kind of designed to use Google Glass to actually be in the room with patients, acquire data, video, and help take the crap off doctor's plates. So you're already making the attending physician's lives easier. Yeah, it, it was actually a pretty popular uh, company with my, with my uh, uh, professors at Stanford, just because all of them hate writing notes also. And so I was like, yeah, I'm going to start a company. You know, we're going to write your notes for you. We're going to save you 15 hours a, w- a week of t- time. And uh, that was the main reason why they let me leave and, and, and stay leafed. Yeah, you're like save medicine or you don't get to come back. Like, have they ever told you that? <laughs> they, actually, that's that's literally the conversation that I have with the uh, the kind of performance committee at Stanford. They're like, <laughs> they say each time they so it's like, what have you accomplished for us this year? <laughs> 70 million, that's okay, but uh, yeah, try yeah. to go for 200 million next round. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're aiming low, son. Uh, and so, they'll call you son because they're going to belittle you that way because they're old. <laughs> but so, so you did Augmetics, and it was yeah. this amazing thing. And I actually remember my friend Albert Chan was on the cover of something using a Google Glass. He was a glass hole, which was what we used to call the people <laughs> I, who I were. Think, I think it was this, this, this uh, small uh, uh, newspaper called the Washington Post, actually. Something like that. Yeah. That <laughs> liberal rag, the Washington Post. I've heard of it. Yeah, you live it? yeah, you live in Washington. You probably because they're probably down the street or something. But uh, but I remember reading about this, going, "Oh, this is a really interesting company." Uh, company, and you were working with my old clinic, Palo Medical Foundation, mm-hmm. and so I had no idea you ran that. And now you're working on something that actually is is a kind of. And yesterday we talked about buzzwords, right? Artificial intelligence is a play to use AI. Just to don't say that you're putting AI on the blockchain to prevent cyber attacks. Because if you do that, you use every single uh, buzzword of JPM. Uh, to, to, you're using AI to actually detect and prevent medical errors at a systems level. And so tell me, what, how did you even get into that? Like, what, how was that an interest of yours? Yeah, so um, I guess when I was at Augmetics, we had a, a lot of conversations with healthcare leaders, you know, people at Sutter, Dignity, et cetera. And we realized that there was this growing chasm between doctors and administrators. Or doctors, no, I no, don't come on. that. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. And doctors this were getting outnumbered, you know, they're like 10 to 1 now. Uh, <laughs> Keep going. This is new to me. Yeah, Keep let's put up, put up the chart of doctors versus administrators. <laughs> no, but and, and you know, like basically every single change in healthcare it seemed like it had to go through the hands of doctors, and doctors were basically more and more under fire. Right? That was actually why I started Augmetics was because it was like, okay, like we can't keep piling stuff on doctor's plates. We need to take stuff off. Yeah. Um, and one of the biggest things that, I, that that we saw was basically all the responsibility for patient care, follow up, diagnose, like. It was all on the doctor. And so you're, you have these mounting pressures of an increasingly complex healthcare delivery system. Patient journeys are getting ridiculous in terms of the path they have to go through. And it's kind of all on the doctor. And so we uh, said, listen, like, 
and the, and the nurses and the, the nurses and the care coordinators and rely on and, them yes, to prevent yeah. errors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. And so um, we basically said, listen, like, why are we? Why is every single technology that we're trying to deploy in healthcare? trying to be shoved into the provider's workflow. Why can't we build solutions that actually help take the burden off? Like Augmentix, where we had help write their notes for them. Or like with Ferrum, where we actually provide them with a, a safety net, right? So like Augmentix a, was a like a scribe ahead of its time. And it was automated, if you will. I mean, it helped with yeah. the documentation burden. Is that, is that a it was Honestly, it, was a tele- it, it is a telemedicine company um, where we use actually, at this point, Google Glass, uh, smartphones, tablets, to stream the patient conversation to an assistant sitting somewhere else in the world. So somewhere like India. Okay. Ah, so that was Augmentix. So, so, yeah. so, so, okay, so, and then that assistant is maybe taking, constructing a note, following up, doing things like that. Yeah. So it's AI by proxy or AI yeah, squared. Yeah, yeah, artificial, artificial intelligence. That's right, yeah. we were talking about the These other day. lights have AI in them. They do. Actually. They're actually oh, on the blockchain on. as well. Um, so Are they so, influencers? <laughs> Now, now you're hitting close to home, okay, Lou. Uh, we're both Stanford boys. We know about yeah, it. So yeah. did you make a lot of money on that first company? It's still running, right? I mean, Augmentix is still scaling. Um, you know, uh, at this point, 30 plus health systems, you know, thousands and thousands of employees. And so for me, it was, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's still a, a story that hasn't, finished yet it's so, a never-ending yeah. story with the dragon that Hope, flies it. exactly hopefully hopefully well so so it's yeah. interesting though because you you, yeah. you have an engineering background you went through medical school when did you decide you were going to start a company and start deferring <laughs> so uh, there was actually it was a it was a very slippery greasy slope um into uh not being in med school um i i'd always had these little side projects so I, I, I my background was mechanical engineering and mm. so i had always done these little like gadgets you know like oh it's just like a origami like iv catheter that won't clot it's like stuff like that right cool and um at one point um when google glass came out we happened to like acquire a pair and we had this like crazy idea which was like listen like i'm a med student my primary job is writing notes for my doctors uh this should be a company. Good med, good, <laughs> good med student. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and yeah so we, good med student. Right? So we we had like a like a, basically like a side project where we I literally went to I went to Nuximity, um, I looked at every single doctor in a two hundred square mile radius, and I said, hey, like, we want to do like a fun thought experiment. Like I want to see if I put a Google Glass on you, um, I want to see if your patient's gonna flip out. Uh, and then, you know, the re- reason is because we want to, one, do a social study on this, and two, because we thought that we might be able to do stuff like write your notes, you know, raise information, do all these valuable tools for doctors. And so we, the only doctor who responded was this guy actually, you know, still a huge champion, um, Angus Matheson up in Wairika, uh, which is... Wairika? Wairika, yeah. Why, Northern excuse California. me, I'm, I'm, what yeah. does that mean? Dude, Wairika is like where they grow like weed before it was a thing, man. Like, oh, Wairika okay. is, it's the bomb up there. So this yeah. guy, Angus. Angus, yeah. So Dr. Angus Dr. was Martin, like, give yo. me a Google Glass and I'll yeah. change the world. And so it was literally, we gave him a Google Glass. His phone was in his pocket. He, he literally was on like a voice call to me. I was in his room and I was running his notes for him. Yeah. And that was the augmentics. And it uh, turns out doctors really like it when you write your notes for them. And so we just kept just scaling, you know, first customers were Dignity and Sutter and just kept going from there. But- I- I just yeah. had an amazing vision, dude. So this is our next company. An army of medical students all working in a basement, with tons of Google Glass, and them just like monkeys transcribing the Bible, but actually with free notes, pizza. With free pizza. Actually, no, like more carb heavy, like uh, you know, like corn dogs, that pasta that the drug companies used to serve us at morning. You can bump it up to Subway. <laughs> so that, that that's post series A. They'll do it for free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They'll do it so, for free. So that yeah. was the basic premise that yeah. started yeah. you on the yeah. Augmentics route. And I think uh, one of the things that we like an opportunity that we saw was that just doctors were you know like they were like the epic list of alerts you have to deal with are just never ending. Right, they're like twenty alerts for each patient. Um, they were all basically mm-hmm. completely ignored. Alarm and, fatigue. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, so like, there's probably a better way to fix all these like gaps in care, these misdiagnoses, these errors. Uh, doctor's not the right place, right? And so that was kind of the, the germination of Ferrum where we said, listen, like, if the doctor's not going to, if we're not going to be able to change every single doctor to make them perfect, and if they're going to continue to be human, then we need to build systems around them that support them for the inevitable time when they make mistakes. And, and this is Ferrum, F-E-R-R-U-M, yes. like yep. ferrous or yes. iron. How'd you come up with the name? Um, we heard a consultant and he said, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is embarrassing. Um, periodic so table. <laughs> back in the day, uh, do you remember you know, there's a periodic table? 
He's, My company's name is Ferrum. Come on. He wanted, yeah, to, call, yeah. he wanted to call it molybdenum, but that was already <laughs> yeah. taken. We were looking for like a, like a, like a short word that uh, had you know relative awareness around, uh, but that had the .dot AI available. Oh, <laughs> that's, how, that's why I became ZDog MD because ZDog MD .dot AI was available. And was exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which is. Horrifically embarrassing, and then like three months later, I'm like, okay, ferumhealth.com is available. Let's cut, snatch that one up because it's way more respectable. So I we're now ferumhealth.com. Got it. But ferum.ai yeah, still redirects What percent of Stanford yeah. medical students have a company? Uh, or like, does anyone not have a company? It, it, I think everyone has an idea that they're. It's kind of Hollywood. Like <laughs> everyone, everyone has like a script. You, know, you, you, you have you know you have a film that you're, you're you know you're shopping around to like everybody has something. I have a script right yeah, exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, interviews and um. But I think it, it's really uh, the challenge with Stanford is, and this is a complete digression, is that like I think Stanford Hospital is incredible, but it definitely doesn't re- reflect American healthcare. So a lot of these companies are like, well, you know, like I have this idea for like delivering better cell therapies to this one subset of like that blood cancers, and it's like. So this yeah. this whole endeavor though was emotional for you. Yeah, you, you lost your grandmother. Was it? Uh, my my uncle actually? Yeah. So uh, I I actually. I was born in the U.S., but I went back to Taiwan for a few years uh, as a as a kid, and was raised by my my uncle for a couple of years. And uh, yeah, about about like six to nine months into starting Ferrum, we uh, we had launched a few pilots in Asia uh, just to just get started. And uh, one of my trips there, I discovered that my uncle had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. And you know, the first product we launched was a tool to try to identify missed diagnoses of cancer. And so you know, grabbed his record and looked at his medical his history and like. Every, he's a heavy smoker. So every single one in the past five years, he had gone and gotten an X-ray or CT scan for lung cancer screening. And uh, in four of the past five years, the lesion was present on the X-ray um, and was missed by the doctor, even though he was being screened for it. And so year five, you know, he loses 20 pounds, becomes cachectic, um, goes in, gets a CT scan. They find, and it's like, you know, like a 1.5 centimeter, like, you know, like speculated lesion, m- m- metastasis to the liver, et cetera. And so he basically passed away uh, like six months after that, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, like, can we curse on this show?" Yes, I was. I was like, "Fuck yeah!" <laughs> I was like, "Well, like, shit!" Like, if I if like we had started Ferrum like five years ago, right, and we had these systems in place, like, there's no way it would have been caught. Like, maybe we'd have missed it once, but like at least like year two, year three, would have been able to find it. Mm-hmm. And so, like, very rapidly became very personal for me. Even though originally it started off as like a philosophical engineering exercise. Right. It was like, oh, like, you know, like in theory, all these medical errors occur. And what if we had systems that could solve them? And then, like, you know, we build it and immediately it, 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 it hits home. Do so, you get confused yeah. who to blame when you get angry, like with your uncle's case? I, I feel like I've been in healthcare for, so, you know, veterans. So I've been in here for so long as a, as a 31 year old. Um, <laughs> but like, it's, it, it, you know, every doctor I know is. And every you know practitioner provider I know is like like you're in healthcare because you want to save lives. You're in healthcare because you want to do like it's not yeah it, it's a system issue right. And so um, to try to blame the doctor, try to blame the radiologists, you know, that's not the right way. And the other thing is that, yeah. and we're going to get back to exactly what sure, Ferrum yeah. does, but like the other thing is that blame doesn't work. So it's um, been kind of looked at when you blame people, they actually become more defensive. They make more errors. If you tell somebody, don't make errors, they actually make more errors. So we need yeah. this kind of just culture process. We need a blameless environment where we can look at the systems and go, okay, there is a human error. What allowed that human error to happen? Mm-hmm. And wh- is it a training issue? Is it that this human is malicious, that something's going on? That's a different thing. Then Mm -hmm. it becomes a a punitive issue. Then it's like we have to deal with this person, but that's unusual. So what what you're saying is, well, let's then create technology that makes the human error unlikely. And listen, it doesn't just help patients, although that's important, it helps us. Because if, if it prevents us from sitting up at night going, I killed somebody, I didn't mean to do it, I'm a horrible human being. A I, terrible I, feeling, I, I felt t- that. Me too. It's the worst feeling in the world. And, and you question everything, right? If you can do that, why, why would we put up roadblocks? I think the biggest roadblock is denial. We don't make mistakes. Because the way you protect yourself against that emotion is you just deny it. Yeah. Um, so, so what? So, tell me what Ferrum does that's actually making this better because I don't understand the technology. Yes, yeah. so cool. I yeah. So, um, so yeah, there, there are 
I think at this point, over 700 AI companies that are out there, 500 of them are machine vision. This is uh, our friends at NVIDIA shared the, the stat. I think it in increased by 200 companies in the past year alone. Wow. Just some metrics. Um, is that including ZDog Industries? Because they yeah. have AI. We have AI. Uh, we have a robot eye AI that yeah. is able to detect haters uh, well in advance of them actually hitting the hate button so yeah. you know uh, but basically we, we we recognize that you know you have all these really powerful predictive algorithms that are out there for basically like, you know, like all these conditions under the sun now and we saw like, listen like rather than try to shove all this information and data into like the mouth of the doctors like it's like you're trying to make foie gras let's actually deploy them in the background let's run all these analytics and all these kind of predictive algorithms these diagnostic algorithms to look for diagnoses across an entire population level so you know lung cancer let's figure out which which small number of the 10,000 scans that a Sutter Health performs per month which ones have a significant lesion right some and then rather a concerning than concerning lesion that yeah. could represent yeah. a cancer and then you know, what's the worst thing that could happen with that lesion? It would be if the doctor's note said that it wasn't there. And mm -hmm. so we actually not just run these kind of diagnostic algorithms, we actually run natural language on the doctor's note to look to see if they caught it. And so we're looking for these very small number of cases where there's a cancer in the image, but the radiologist report, the, you know, the dictated document says lungs are normal. And so it turns out that happens a ton, actually. That's yeah. horrifying and unsurprising. One thing I'd ask, though, because I mentioned this to my wife mm -hmm. yesterday, she's a chest radiologist, and she's like, wait, but are they making sure that these lesions that they're correlating to know nothing in the note, right? Yeah. That those are actually cancer or that they're a nodule that was already recognized as benign and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so it's, that's a great question. And I like. I didn't quite graduate med school yet, so I, I, I'm definitely not allowed to opine on this. Can we pimp him? We should pimp him, right? <laughs> oh, what chromosome so is hereditary dwarfism on? Oh, God. <laughs> Eye cell disease. What's the metabolic cause? Can you believe they ask that shit on exams? Yeah. Yes. Yes, MLEs. Mm -hmm. I used to, chromosome? I, I used Who to, gives a shit what chromosome something I is I used on? to work. I love how we totally derailed him to go on this rant. I used to work for first aid <laughs> for the boards. It. You know first aid for the boards, Oh, right? my God, yeah. Which boards have you taken so far? Uh, step one. Oh, the one, one that, yeah. that you study for, for months, and then step two is like two weeks, and then step three yeah. is a number two pencil. So I, w I would write these questions. Vikas Bouchon ran this company okay. in Taule, first aid for the board. Yeah. I became friends with them, UCSF guys. I would fly down to his place at Bel Air. He would feed all this army of medical students this junk food and Indian food, and he's like, hey, have fun, guys. Also edit all this material for free. So we would free. do it. Well, I think he paid Pizza. us like a, some yeah nominal <laughs> fame and you know okay, little yeah. citation in the thing oh my god i'm published in first aid and and i just realized most of it is abjectly useless information and you can look it up on the internet i mean they have computers now what where if you need to know what chromosome is hereditary dwarfism on you could type it into computers now connected by right. the internet please tell the usmle test tape makers and the double amc and the graduate education council Please tell them uh, I, that we have computers and we're stuffing our med students' creative brains with this useless SHIT that we that's can otherwise shit. be using to, to explore creativity and do cool things like what you're doing. Uh, can I I'll make some one more thing before we no, let him talk no. about his life's passion? Um, <laughs> what if we made step one an open internet test where you had the internet, but you had to sort through the garbage on there to get the right answer. That would be brilliant. Wouldn't that be crazy? Because oh that's yeah. what a doctor that, has to do. Or only make you well, memorize things you need to the, know in emergencies. Exactly right. The, the slippery slope would be like, then you make up one about how do you write a soap note, right? And then, oh, and so it's, or it's, how to, how to click the boxes in, in, in Epic. Yeah, like what, what, what like quick pimp, pimping you on like what's the difference so how many uh, elements of the you know uh, review systems you need for a 99213 quick go oh my god billing <laughs> so that's that's billing, terrifying billing. I would so, not want to do so back that. to the question about okay the, <laughs> sorry <laughs> so you not only catch lesions yeah. that are missed by a radiologist mm -hmm. report but also if it's in the report and there's no follow-up yeah that is another gap in care that you identify and it's not like you're bad or wrong it's here's a list of patients that at your hospital mm -hmm. where there was a lesion missed on the report or a lesion on the report that did not have follow-up, yep. and it's just in sharing information. It's creating a safety yep. net. Yeah, and, and, and actually, like, it's not just cancer. It's not just radiology, right? It, basically, any diagnosis is, any diagnostic error is gonna be diagnostic, like quantitative data that reflects it in the record with a subjective information, right? a diagnosis or a note that doesn't. 
So let, let me re, let yeah. me reiterate this so I to make sure I yeah. understand. You take like lab or diagnostic data that is actually objective. Here yep. it is. This is what we yep. found. And, and that includes natural language reports from radiologists, yep. say, all right? You take that and then you correlate it to the natural language note data that you're looking for. Did they actually follow up or report this in the note? Yep. And if there's a discordance, then you go, okay, that's the potential for an error or a missed thing. Yep. And the cool part about this approach and it's is that you can deploy this across an entire health system, an entire population, an entire country, maybe. And like the doctors don't have to do anything, right? Like, Wait, what? They just I keep like practicing, right? Like, if you're a doctor, you're a radiologist, you're a physician, you just keep reading your scans, right? And the system's running in background. And you know, once in a while, you know, maybe once a month, you'll miss something really bad. It'll, it'll, and it'll be routed towards our system. We'll flag it. It'll be reviewed by subject matter experts in the quality committee. And that's, by the way, the answer to your wife's question. Um, ah, okay, so and, an expert then looks at it and goes, okay, yeah. this was a bullshit lesion, yeah. it's not a big deal, yeah. or this is actually something that was yeah. missed. And so we have like a panel of like three like thoracic radiologists at uh, like our, our US accounts, and they're the ones who are like this or that, ah. right? So it's like so, Simon Cowell, this was, uh, you know, at uh, America's Got Talent, this, that was self-indulgent, this lesion is, is totally bogus, not ever gonna grow up to be a cancer. It's not good enough. It doesn't have what it takes. Someone's mother told this lesion, you'll be a cancer, and it believed it, and, and it's nothing. We, we get a lot of those, or sometimes, you know, AI is not perfect. Sometimes you get like, that's a sinus polyp. How did that image even get into this system, right? right. And so- But a false positive is okay. You're just saying, hey, these yeah, yeah. are the 20 cases yeah. this month where there's a disconnect between what the AI picked up mm -hmm. on the CT and the report. Yep. Take a take another look at these twenty. Now, do yeah. you develop the AI yourself to identify these lesions on CTs and imaging? No, actually. So uh, we there. There's so much out there now. I mean, there are so many algorithms. There's so many companies everywhere you look. It's how it's many? Seven hundred companies. Seven hundred companies yeah. have AI for radiology. Yeah, and the, because it's the lowest hanging. AI, AI for healthcare. It's, AI, oh, yeah, five hundred for radiology. And, and this is real AI. It's not like a computer detecting something and then sending it to a human to go. Yes, that's a lesion. <laughs> I'm sure some of it's that. But, some of it's that. Yeah. But things like like algorithms are easy to build now if you have the data, right? Like right. like you just Google has basically open sourced all of TensorFlow, Facebook has all of PyTorch. So you literally just take a data set, you throw it into this like model, and it'll like spit out some predictions. But they might not be very those, good. Getting that right, data right, can yeah. be hard. How the many companies are reading x-rays, radiology films with AI to be able to flag things? Oh man, at least like 40 or 50 that really? we know of, yeah. And you yeah. just, you basically just partnered with one of them? Uh, several of them, yeah. Okay. And so there's a lot of open source stuff out there. The NEH has fantastic data sets for mammography, x-ray, CT scans. And so you can use those data sets to build basic algorithms. So now here's what my yeah. audience will say and what I say. Okay, yeah. the system, you know, the, the Skynet uh, decides <laughs> this lesion is missed and flags it. Next thing you know, there's a pop-up in Epic from the administrator to you going, hey, Dr. Demania, you missed a potentially fatal, you know, lung lesion mm -hmm. that was found, that then you never followed up on it. Come to the office of HR for your beating. <sighs> that's what people are worried about. Yeah. Now, because that's not a just culture. Yep. That's not a root cause analysis. That's not looking at, you know, the, the chart, you know, was, was this area malicious? Was it, what was going on? Was it a systems error? Would yeah. reasonable authorities also miss this? You know, there's a whole process. It's absolutely the wrong approach to yep. patient safety. Just yep. beat down the individual. Right. Look, we gotta take individual responsibility we want to learn. Look, people want to do better. When you tell mm -hmm. them you missed something, they feel horrible. They feel yeah. terrible. We don't need to beat them up and fire them and scold them and ridicule them. Let's look at this system. Yeah. And and that's, plus, we, we don't report errors if we're beaten up and scolded. We don't even talk about it except no. in the locker room. That's true. And then it's like this really deep kind of like, you know, you go to the the, 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 the lounge and you're just like, dude, so then I, 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 I think I killed this patient. And it's the worst. Com you know, I had a text from a friend the other day. And it was again. Why are you texting me? I haven't talked to you in a long time. And it was an error that was made. And and just you could just feel through the text. Like they were making a joke to try to disarm it. But I was like, this is hard. I've made these mistakes. And and so so how how do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's got to be a challenge for you because oh, you're going right. to get resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's probably the biggest challenge that that we we, we face off with a lot of this because doc. You know, if you're a ring of fire radiologist or doctor, like you are very concerned about Skynet, Big Brother, all that. Um, you have, like, basically, one is you have to basically, as a company, have a very, very strong stance on this. Yeah. And so we are very firm that, like, when we, when we generate reports, the doctor's name's not involved, right? The process, the process of review is objective and blended. 
et cetera, right? And then they can, just, they can go look the doctor up, they can find it, right. but as much as possible, we kind of separate out that the component of measurement tracking, you know, you made a mistake, right? And it's all routed through um, the quality community and, and stays within the department. So never, we never allow it to rise up to leadership in a way that can target individual physicians. So there's technology and product changes that you can make there. Could this apply to nursing, frontline nursing? So administration of drugs. This is what was ordered. This is what was given. This, you know, could that be the same thing? Yeah, I, I, I think it could be. Um, the the thing with like a lot of these, like the, the biggest benefits of the EHR actually have been realized in like you know computerized order entry, right? So like, actually, you've had a dramatic reduction in the rate of these sort of like like medication errors, that, handwriting you, errors, yeah, transcription yeah. errors, yeah. But like what that's meant is there's so much more data. Right. So diagnostic errors are rising. You know, di diagnostic errors are now probably the, one of the leading causes of errors now, now that these kind of like very basic medication, you know, t types of errors have, have reduced. Oh, that's interesting. Do you yeah. think they're rising or do you think we're just catching them more because we're focusing on them? What do you think it is? I, I like, some, like, if you look at the average radiologist um, and how their practice today is different than the practice like 10 years ago, yeah. they're reading like 13 times as many images. Really? Right. Keep going, keep going. Yep. Their, their reimbursements have dropped by 35%. And so they're spending like three, four seconds per image uh, powering through. And every single year they have to read like another 10 more CT scans per day or whatever, just to stay even. And so it's definitely gonna get, it's definitely getting worse. So what Pelu is saying is actually spot on. And the, in the experience of my wife, so my wife, Worked at Stanford years ago. We left for seven years, came back. The volume is so high now. And even with fellows and residents, she's coming home and working from home with her big ass screens. And the kids are like, but mom, normally you read us this stuff and you do violin with us and daddy's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and and it's true. And on top of that, I've heard stories from people who've come out of academics. They go to say Las Vegas to one of these big volume mills in Las Vegas. I won't name names. And they said that they were forced to read so many films that they stopped even like on chess films that they stopped looking at bones because there wasn't enough time. And that's part of how you read a film. So of course you're going to miss stuff. We're human beings, right? So that pressure is remarkable and i yeah. worry about losing that dialogue between the clinician and the radiologist it's because gone, that man. is invaluable certainly in my practice that's yeah. invaluable what do you think and could could it be this and there's a history of this and yeah, and the radiologists there's... love that dialogue they do they, they absolutely do and you think that they don't you think they're these kind of moles these naked mole rats <laughs> that sit in the thing and it, but but they but they well that was yesterday's conversation oh, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Pelu made a face like Huh? Naked so. mole rat. But but the, but the idea that um, they actually thrive on clinical information. It's mm -hmm. garbage in, garbage out. Well, they don't want to make a mistake. I mean, workplace happiness, according to Miles Lodge, is driven by feedback from the recipients yep. of your services. And radiologists struggle, right? People don't come yep. up and say, thank you for reading that normal chest x-ray. <laughs> That was it really reassured. It really reassured me. Right. It really yeah. allowed yeah. us to proceed to surgery without any. You know, people don't give. A, and when you do tell that them, hey, so that nice. was so my, like I, I felt warm when you said that. I mean, has, right? Yeah. Have you ever gone to a radiologist and said, you know what? It turns out that was appendicitis. We did the operation, so you were correct. Yeah. They love that feedback. Yeah. yeah. They love that. Feedback. And they love uh, tough questions and clinicians that seem engaged. And it, it, we, 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 it, it's, and it's been lost. Yeah. It's kind of like our, our doctor's lounge is gone. Like we don't have a doctor's yeah. lounge. So now we don't get to share these stories and commiserate with each other and communalize our pain and do all the things that we used to do. So you know what? I'm officially offering ZDoc Industries as the virtual doctor's lounge. <laughs> there's no doctor's lounge in the hospital because there's there's no CPT code now for lounging out. <laughs> you can't you can't bill for granola bar not otherwise specified, right? Um, yeah, and, and you know, so what? Yeah. It's it's interesting. So I want to ask you this though, because what you're doing is you're creating a backstop. You're saying okay, and and I suspect if I'm reading between the lines, if you had your way and that technology grew, it would do more and more and more to keep us safer. And then it would start to butt up against where humans go. But 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 what about us? But I don't think we can ever be. Re it's going to take a long time. People don't realize how primitive this AI still is. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, you're working in it. Yeah. T uh, tell like, us how close we are to Skynet. We are so so far. I mean, um, like what, what is Skynet? Skynet is ter the Terminator uh, movie. So it's, <laughs> it's the AI that became sentient and launched a nuclear strike, destroyed humanity, created a robot army that went back in time to try to kill, kill Sarah, Sarah Connor. Connor. Yep. Yeah, more or less. That's the one. Oh, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just ruined Terminator for a whole generation. For like five people that haven't seen it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, like, like all the data that you see out there for um, like AI that's superhuman, it's so like, well, we had this like this one specific GE scanner that we did like 
500,000 like, you know, mammograms on and like we had, the, so this AI is perfect for this one scanner. Um, it's, it's not scalable and it makes, it, does, it still does really stupid things if you just like poke it slightly with a stick. Oh, and so like you, you can't trust patient care to that because it's just going to like, oh, that's a Phillips scanner and like, Throw, throw up on it, right? Interesting. So there's all this stuff. And then also, like, you know, there's all these issues around, like, like how do you balance for ethnic populations, right? Like, like African-American mammograms versus Asian mammograms versus Caucasian mammograms, all different densities. They all have different rates of cancer. Thank you. And so anything that's going to be, uh, and, you know, all the algorithms are trained on Caucasian women. And so, like, Asian women end up getting overdiagnosed. African-American women get underdiagnosed. Like, there's so many problems here. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And actually sitting in that seat was David Magnus, bioethicist at Stanford, okay. who is an AI expert on the bioethics of AI. And he said exactly that. He goes, when you feed it information from a Caucasian population and it comes out, it, 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 it's going to be skewed information. Mm -hmm. And how about this? How about you ask it a question? How, how do we save healthcare costs? The AI will, by definition, bias itself against African Americans because in the data set, African Americans cost more because of the social determinants of health that are failing them. No. So this is why garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And I'm glad that you said that there are these limitations because people seem to think that AI is gonna become sentient all of a sudden and, and we're all out of a job. But that's not how this works. We need yeah. to embrace and grow the stuff that's gonna take the human error off the plate, allow us to do what we do uniquely, yeah. which is be human. And I, you know, like in theory, you could, you could, you could reproduce what we're doing right now with Ferrum, with like, you know, an army of med students, right? You just right. teach them all how to look for lung nodules and every single scan you perform, you just have them check for lung nodules, right? Uh, that's not to operate on top of your license. So I think right. what AI can do is you think about um, like the really, the stuff that if you had unlimited labor and unlimited workforce, that was just like, you know, like a first year med student at best, mm -hmm. what could you do, right? And so that's kind of with Ferrum, that's kind of the approach you took. Have you thought about the, the what we call in, in public health the moral hazard mm. of something that makes something it makes a system safer? So, in other words, if you have a lawnmower that changes the tipping point so it can handle you know a higher angle slope, people will drive it to the edge of the lawnmower's limits and will still <laughs> tip at the same frequency. That's the moral hazard theory. And so, you know, maybe with seatbelts, people drive more hazardously. I, right. Oh, I'm, and, I'm, I'm getting in trouble with some of our companies. Um, but uh, you know how mammography CAD, you know, this, you know, these are AI to help figure out what breast cancer is there, right? You right. know how it's supposed to be used is the doctor reads the image first independently. Once they're done reading it and writing the note, they then press a button and it turns on this CAD system that like highlights things that they may have missed. And then they go in and adjust the note, right? Like what actually happens is they just turn it on in the beginning look at what it points at them, and they move on. Oh, my God. And so studies have shown that, like, physicians, and this is studies out of, like, I think, like, uh, Harvard and, like, Seattle and stuff. Um, do doctors that use CAD actually do worse. They have lower specificity, lower sensitivity oh, than those who smokes. don't. It's the moral hazard. Moral hazard. And so they're getting paid because <laughs> they pay for CAD. So you get, like, 35 bucks or something like that per time you use CAD reimbursed. And <laughs> they're getting paid to be lazier and deliver worse care. Um, some of that's limitations of the AI, right? And the AI is getting better, and so it will will improve. But you're absolutely right. And so for us, uh, the approach we're taking has a fundamental safeguard to that, right? It's not going straight back to the doctor where they can just like kind of click them, like, well, it's probably normal since the AI said so. It's going to like a you know an area that like at least has some level of guardianship. It's not administrators who can slap you on the wrist, but it is you know your peers, the subject matter experts, the 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 kind of radiologists who are you know are around you. And I, that's uh, it's one of those things that people don't get very often, but it's so critical. Oh man, I couldn't agree more. You know, you know the earliest example of AI that you would would this moral hazard issue yeah. is the Hewlett Packard algorithm on the EKG machine. So the, the, the auto reading EKG and it's like, uh, you know, you, 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 you met as a medical student, you grab that EKG <laughs> off and you're like, well, it looks like a AFib with a barency. <laughs> you oh, know, did you read the, the, the interpretation? Oh no. It's, what's that say? No, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, right. Oh, what's oh. that say? And then you look at it and it says nothing like AFib with a barency, right? And he's like, well, but because, so explain why that is. Well, the, the P waves are what? <laughs> So this is a real phenomenon because humans are humans and we're yeah. only as good as our incentives. Yeah. And so we have to we have to we have to do some engineering yeah. to make sure that we Well the the other thing is that and I, I feel like this is something that I've become like I've just had to come to terms with is I feel like the only tools that you can get doctors to use now, um, with the time that they have and the, the precious, precious minutes they have in their day, are tools that make them more productive. Yeah. Like I actually think that if you ask healthcare to have its doctors trade off five percent of their time in productivity for five percent better quality. 
your company will never go off the ground. Yeah. So if all, the only thing doctors can buy or, or use are productivity solutions, then how do you fix quality? Right. And so like mm. that was one of those things I kept getting frustrated by with my first company because I, I kept trying to develop <clears throat> tools and products that would deliver higher quality care. Yeah. I could never get them into the doctor's workflow and have them actually use it. And that's, that was one of those things I was like, oh, it's because like quality is a system level issue. It's not a physician level issue. What right. a great insight, actually. People should listen to that carefully who are trying to start companies and things like that, because that's one of the most important insights. And you do meet clinicians every now and then who don't really care. Their heart's not in it. And yeah. the reality is it's both, right? It's the system, primarily, I believe. And it's the individual. It's personal responsibility. It's caring. And it's both, right? When yeah. somebody does something carelessly, you better believe we're telling them, look, you have a personal responsibility to do your best. You screwed up. Now, I've done it myself. We're not going to blame you, you know, for everything going wrong. We should have a safe system to pick up on this. But it's both systems and personal responsibility. Yeah. Agree. And it's, it's interesting because the comments are, are fascinating, too. So, so somebody actually asked, oh, Amy Gunmanson asked, male versus female, is there a difference in how, we, how they behave? And you know, one, one thing that David Magnus kind of in, implied to me is that we could solve most medical malfeasance, in other words, intentional fraud and, and evil activity, like an oncologist pretending to find cancers and treating with chemo because they're getting paid, by only letting women into medical school. With the idea they're more conscientious in general. And the data shows that they commit these malfeasances at an almost infinitesimally small rate. And, and then there's the theory that, well, that's because they're always afraid of rocking the boat because the hierarchy is so awful and they don't want to have the bring attention and, and so on. And so this is a very complicated, uh, interesting kind of scenario. Mm. Yeah. What med, what med student rotations do you have to finish up to get your <laughs> MD degree? Oh. He, was, he was telling me. But yeah, uh, I, uh, I, it, they're good ones too. They're yeah, good ones. Yeah. I, I have, um, I got to do a, a psychiatry sub I at, at Paul de Vier, which I... It's a good, that's fun. Love, You'll learn a lot. Love. Yeah, exactly. Um, you actually have an opportunity to learn because you have a little time and space. Um, right. Um, pathology elective, um, uh, step two, CK and CS, and two ACLS. And then I'm done. Okay. So I think what's going to kick kick your ass is ACLS, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it now if you yeah, want. Yeah, we'll do it right now. I, yeah. I, I, I've learned it like four times, and it's different every time. It's, you, it's, dude, we should totally fuck with them and be like, yeah, so Britillium is the first line agent <laughs> For <laughs> you have to know what chromosome hereditary dwarfism is on on your ACLS exam. Oh, if I saw that, that would that would just kill me. It would kill you. Now, so here, here's a here's another question though, because yeah. I get the sense, and I don't get this with a lot of uh, engineer types, that you have a very high emotional intelligence. <laughs> that or you, you actually fake it really well. Yeah, or you fake it really well, right? Yeah. Well, no, actually, yeah. that's a real thing. So I know people. I know people in the top echelons of tech companies mm -hmm. who have learned to fake that well. They've read books like The Game the, by Strauss and these guys because the game is basically written by psychopaths on how to manipulate people. And so they're able to fake a degree of emotional intelligence and so on. But I get the sense yours is genuine. What is keeping you up at night? What's hurting you? What's causing you pain? Because I know that founders of these companies are under more stress than people understand, having been one myself. What what is it like for you? Because you're young, you're only thirty one. Yep, uh, I I actually make a joke with uh, a lot of my founder friends whenever we you know kvetch about being founders, and it's like, listen, like I I'm doing this company, you know, we're like trying to fix this massive cause of like we have an opportunity to really change the world here, like if it doesn't go anywhere, I must do like a rcm nlp billing coding analytics optimization company and just like become a million like like <laughs> screw like this is the last shot that i'm gonna give healthcare to try to help it because <laughs> it's so wrong. hard it's so hard to fix it's there's so much inertia and you know like and so you have to look for these narrow windows of opportunity where like cool like, i can do good i can like find medical errors and the thing in the fever service world is like most of the time you improve quality it actually costs money costs money because there's less yeah. less complications yeah. yeah and one of the insights we had was like actually like when you miss a diagnosis of cancer or any organism or an infection right like you actually uh that's a really uh damaging financial situation for the hospital. I mean, it's just not just like the malpractice risk in the lawsuit. The average cancer lawsuit, lung cancer lawsuit is $1.3 million. Oh my God. Right? And so like, you know, we're finding hundreds of these at, at our hospitals. So like there's a lot of money there. Also, if you're missing hundreds of cancers, that's millions of dollars of downstream revenue that you could be making for, for the hospital. And so we're like, okay, wait, like actually this is like the only, the only place in quality, the only opportunity we have to improve healthcare quality 
that like hospitals can buy. Right. And you know, I've been looking at the kind of the sector for a really long time and there are very few opportunities like that. Hey, Usually you're either making more money for insurers, making money for hospitals, or you're a quality solution that is too kumbaya to survive in the real world. Like those are the three kind of actual uh, companies. And you're in a bunch saying. of hospitals, right? You're yeah. actually in what? 15 hospitals? Yeah, yeah uh, 12 hospital systems uh, around right. the world, including the largest hospital in the world, uh, Changgeng Memorial Hospital in Taipei. Oh, wow. Uh, guess how many beds they have? So largest Stanford's like 500, 600 beds? Yeah. 2,000. Uh, I'm going to say 800. 10,000 beds. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like a city. It's like a, yeah. Oh, my God. How many occupants of those beds need to be in a bed? It, yeah, right. Well, because this is Taipei's so, single pair. cataract yeah, patient. Just ta- yeah. Yeah. Ta- Taiwan's healthcare system is shaw- It's like the most efficient system in probably the, like the world. Yeah. They have like best, like top, top decile like cancer outcomes. And they spend an average of their average cancer patient. I was meeting with the ministry of uh, the health insurance agency. The average cancer patient, they spend $3,000 a year on. That's crazy. And they have wow. like top decile but so, results. So there was a recent article about yeah. this that I shared on my page, actually about Taipei or Taiwan's yeah. uh, single payer system. It's very efficient, but the doctors are very unhappy as a rule because they are very they're the least staffed in like the developed world or something like they, and, and so they work really hard. Yeah. So they, they they quoted one doctor saying Taiwan's uh, system is a heaven for patients because there's a minimal copay. Everybody gets seen for anything, but there may be a wait, but it's not that bad, and it's hell for doctors. So it's kind of interesting. So yeah. you always have a trade off with that yeah. but yeah 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 but so sorry we were in we were talking about something oh he's being in multiple hospitals oh i get it gets back to what chris jones the venture hospital venture guy we had on the show yesterday was talking about which is why can't we pay for things that actually make care better and don't have to think about these horrible conflicts that you're having and i made a comment to amy baxter two days ago about healthcare attracts the d-list business talent now why is that why is that because a guy like Pelu, who's super smart, who cares about people, could make money so much easier doing like billing, co- like a natural language <laughs> processing for billing codes. And so why not just go work in investment banking or something like that? And that's, and that's what a lot of them do. And then we're left with people who don't really understand business that well. And then we have a guy like you that's like struggling to fight against the culture. And, and it's really hard. Saving lives. And Saving you know, lives. You're in Sutter Health as much yep. as we, we body slammed Sutter Health Constantly. Here for, and I work for Sutter. For, yeah. For yeah. Anti, uh, antitrust practices and price gouging, they paid $570 million, $575 million in a settlement because of price gouging and antitrust practices. We hit them for that. But they're actually a doc, they're doing you know, something amazing. Just yeah. to our point earlier about, you know, we were talking about the, the groups in healthcare you think you can vilify turns out there's amazing people working in in those systems and i think i think that's that's the key here is um like m- the vast majority of healthcare is risk averse they're driven by fear their yes. followers they um basically wait until the last possible moment to th- that they have to do something to do it right and so um you but there are those people out there there are people who they are in healthcare because for personal reasons for you know like ethical reasons, they, they want to improve things, and you just have to actually find them. And oftentimes, they are the ones who are in positions of power, maybe not the very top, but they might be departmental chairs, they might be you know regional leaders, they might be hospital CEOs. And they are actually oftentimes willing to just like bulldog stuff through because they do have that moral compass. And they'll make, they'll, they'll, they're basically going to be our first you know, 10, 20 customers, right? This, then, is, this yeah. is so important for people to hear because it's absolutely true. You find the passionate progressive advocates within those organizations. Like me and me and Marty would never be able to do speaking if there weren't advocates within these organizations because we're a bit on the maverick side uh, on the fringes of that. Pushing like, the field. Pushing the field. Uh, that's how you like to cause it. I'm just like, I'm not burning all down to the ground. And But, but the people who get it are the progressive. They push yeah. it through and then you go and they realize, wow, that's a thing. Yeah. And, and that's what you're trying to do. Too. And actually, one of the just like one of the things that's really fun for me is that like oftentimes you think about like who are the, the techno trailblazer AI enthousi- enthusiasts who are like you know like going out there and like coding and like those aren't actually our staunchest champions, right? The people who are like, holy crap, this is really cool. They're like the you know the 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 doctor leaders who somehow, despite being 65, still have a little bit of you know hope and optimism and yeah. idealism and like. We find them there, right? But, I see them all the time. Yeah, you see them too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because we both travel a lot. I mean, we see yeah. it all the time. Take hope, you guys. Like this is—we're so full of despair. 
<laughs> you know? Well, that's why I just think it's so cool. Sutter Health is adopting yeah. your technology. I mean, Sutter Health is this, right, this system that has done things that we've criticized for price gouging, and yet they're leading the way in patient safety, mm -hmm. adopting, believing in what you're doing, yep. saying, hey, we're going to make the investment, spend money, even though there may not be a financial case, because it could help patients. I, uh, there, I think the reason why we're able to uh, actually get even these fee for service accounts is because there is a massive financial case to fixing medical errors when it's a diagnostic omission, right? When it's yeah. a cancer that you missed, yeah. um, that's a lot of uh, kind of opportunity to provide more care. Also, it's a lot of opportunity to not get sued. And, you know, mm -hmm. you most hospital systems definitely want to avoid these losses. Like that, that's like, like they happen all the time. Yeah. They get a ton of press. There's a sad patient face on the cover. Like it's the worst for these administrators. And so we're able to both appeal to the, the fear and risk aversion of a lot of systems. And also these, you know, like key champions who are optimists, who are, you know, right. trying to move things forward. But it, I feel like it's a little bit of like the, like the, you got to have uh, the positive message and you have to have this like aspirational ideal. And then like, you do need some of this, uh, Practical, practical, practical yeah, stuff. Exactly. Is that, so that was our, you know, when I was running turntable, our, yeah. our whole thing was preventative primary care, team based, more expensive than standard primary care, but reduces downstream costs. Well, who's going to hate that? Hospitals, because hospitals are getting 50% less admissions from our patients. Specialists, because they're not going to get to do all the usual bogus referrals that they don't need because our guys practice at the top of their license and gals. So you're starting to hurt people that are making a lot of money. Whether they do this consciously or not, mm -hmm. they will start to resist. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only that, but you just won't even get the meetings. Yep. And I think that was the big, and, and you know, go to a self-funded employer, they're paying all the bills. They don't want a medical error. They don't want, you know, they don't want any of this. And yet their TPA that administers the plans is like working with United Health. And it turns out United Health wants to own all of it. So they don't want to outsource it to somebody else. Now you have a $20 billion monolith opposing what you do because it will mess up their global domination plans. These are good people in bad systems, by the way. I know a lot of people at United that are fantastic people. Mm -hmm. But as a thing, if you own the PBM, you own the doctors, you own the insurance, okay, what can't you do? Well, you can't not make a shit ton of profits every <laughs> single fucking day. So I'm off my soapbox. Sorry, I yeah. get a little. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, a, I'm just like a, like a, you know, a little like Silicon Valley fan. I'm just trying to build a company here, guys. Like, Are you? In, like, <laughs> I don't even want to be associated with that rant. No, no, no. Uh, Are you in the three comma club? No. <laughs> Do, the, do you True. have the doors that, that go like this or the doors that go like this? Two lousy cops. Health, health, healthcare founder, you, you, again, you don't go into healthcare for the money uh, and you especially don't try to improve quality in healthcare for the money. <laughs> that's that's 100% true. Yeah. So how how are you doing? You live in the city yeah. and you're a young guy. Are you, I'm going to ask all kinds of personal questions of now, course, right? Yeah. You don't have to answer them if you don't want to, but you better because otherwise my audience is going to make fun of you. W by the way, one audience member, Daniel Handian, who's an intern uh, in family medicine, uh, said uh, he really respects your collar game. He thinks you have three okay. three collars going, and they look hot. He's so a Jersey guy, actually. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Me too. We're, oh, really? we're in Jersey. Uh, uh, South Brunswick, so around Princeton Central. Yeah. Nice Morristown. Oh shit! Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. We're homies. So, uh, so are you married? Uh, no, no, and, and and not to a person, but to your startup. You, to your startup, you probably are. My 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 one, my one one true love. My my company. How much <laughs> how much sleep do you get each day? Uh, actually, I, I'm one of those people who cannot function without like so decent value sleep. it yeah uh it's mainly just that i'm useless without it um actually i had a major breakthrough apparently i have been i like, grind my teeth like none other yeah and i like started wearing mouth guard and i've gotten like the best sleep i've gotten in a long long time so, wow yeah so between great. mouth guard and obstructive sleep apnea people get get terrible sleep yeah so it's good that you figured that out yeah now notice how successful and productive you are you get enough sleep so it's almost like, well, I'm too successful and productive. I can't get enough sleep. No, you will never be successful and productive unless we, you get enough we, sleep. Silicon Valley definitely fetishizes the concept of like the four hour, you know, CEO. Who, like, and I, that's, that's the people I know who do that. They just, they burn out in three, four years. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Shorter and then there's, lifespans. And, and then there's Elon Musk. So, you know, like, yeah, don't, well, don't, he's yeah. a different, yeah. Yeah. yeah cocaine yeah. is a hell of a drug. Yeah. I made that up. I have no, <laughs> no evidence of that. It just feels right. <laughs> this list talk price just. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, this is a market moving show, right? That's, here. that's right. Yeah. It, we're again, we're on Animal Planet on all the major networks. Yeah, I think yeah. they're going to call us back. 
<laughs> so yeah. you're doing okay? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, again, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the main reason any of us does any of this is because we actually feel like we can change stuff. And so for me, uh, the, the thing that wakes me up every day is like we have dashboards that show like all of like the radiologist confirmed medical errors that are being detected and addressed, you know, all the follow ups, all these like patients who have, uh, you know, cancer that we're actually diagnosing early uh, instead of missing it. And like, you know, like, that's something that's a personal story for not just me, but like a, like a lot of people on our team and a lot of people probably in the audience have these stories of a family member who had breast cancer that was missed or, you know, someone who had pancreatic cancer that was missed. It's shocking how often I talk to people who are, you know, like, like a, like red meat eating uh, venture capitalist. And I'll tell them the story and be like, Oh wow. Like, um, like I, like my, my, my father actually had the story. Like I'm not going to invest in you cause I don't believe in the whole quality shtick, but like, <laughs> like this is deeply personally touching for me. <laughs> they're a human being for one minute. They become a human being. And then for they one minute. Snap back. And then they're back person. into the suit <laughs> <laughs> with the duck tie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We see it all the time, right? In surgical oncology, we see people that are, um, you know, seeing us after they look back and realize, hey, a year ago, I went to the emergency room with a little jaundice, and they just gave me some antibiotics saying it was a little infection. And they l realize you see all these sort of regrets. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is public information, I, even though he was, um, you know, came to Johns Hopkins, but Steve Jobs had a lot of regrets about his care, yeah. right? And he... Um, People have a lot of regrets when they realize, hey, things could have been done differently. Yeah, and he also like, yeah, he did, he did. And there was a lot of things even in the book about you know naturopathic stuff. And was it? Let me ask you a question. This is kind of unrelated, but not entirely. So, are you seeing more pancreatic cancer than you used to? Um, the incidence is about the same. For about forty thousand people a year mm. die from pancreatic cancer, and that has really not changed in the last several decades mm. and our survival rate is still very poor so i hear from so many people on the kind of front lines they say we're seeing more of it and maybe it's perceptual but it doesn't look like it's translating into you know when people get pancreatic cancer oftentimes um they are not cured they struggle with the the cancer for three to five years and they're not cured and out there very few are cured and out there People are a little older than, say, com breast cancer patients. There are so many breast cancer survivors that they're out there in the world mm -hmm. telling people, hey, th I went through this. We need more detection. We need more research. We need to do a, a car wash and a dance-a-thon and a comb and run. We don't have that in pancreatic cancer, even though about the same number of people die each year from breast cancer as they do from pancreatic cancer. Mm. You would think the incidence of pancreatic cancer uh, death rates are, you know, that it's equal or it's 10 times higher because we spend more than 10 times the money on breast cancer research yeah. than we do on pancreatic cancer research. Mm. So when Alex Trebek gets uh, pancreatic cancer, we think, you know, it's, it's good to have a, visible spokesperson mm, who can mm, talk about mm. and that it's not good he got cancer but it's good that people realize um yeah. you know yeah that's uh, actually it's very very similar to the challenges that medical errors have as as well and that like you know like no one ever ha like people don't feel like they died of medical error they feel like they died of the lung cancer they died of mm. you know the organism right and so you don't have like medical awareness medical error awareness marches or like foundations for medical errors right mm. but um, so that the actual funding in the space, the even like attention that's being given is like, even compared to any of these cancers is basically non-existent. But you're seeing it with the opioid epidemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people are going really hard on that. Yeah. Like medical errors. You don't, yeah, you're right. You don't have like a pink ribbon and you go walking around the street. And I think doctors would be very uncomfortable with a medical error march. Yep. And nurses would be very uncomfortable with a medical error march. But we ought to be the ones leading the march. Mm -hmm. Help us make less errors. Yep. It's ironic. We debate, is our medical errors the third or fourth leading cause of death in the United States? We don't know, right? It's somewhere in there. They're, these are all estimates. But it's yep. ironic. Medical error. So the number one cause of death in the United States in people under 50 is prescription opioids. Yep. Mm -hmm. Aren't most of those deaths due to medical errors, people getting mm -hmm. opioids they should have never yeah. gotten that I prescribed for years that I, yeah. with good intentions and bad science? Medical errors are really, they have many manifestations. Yep. And if we can just stop blaming individuals and say, hey, look, the system 
promoted inappropriate opioid prescribing and yeah. it promoted missing things and it you know it didn't it burn out doctor when i think when doctors are are burnt out when they have this moral injury they're far more likely to make mistakes. Yeah. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah, because yeah, we're deep, we're depersonalized from the root of what we do, and also I think we are already beating ourselves up. So already it's about us. It's not about a systems issue where we fit in the system. It's about me in a silo suffering and what's going to make my life better. So yeah, I, I, I think that's incredibly uh, important. Uh, and, and again, we have to start to talk about these as systems. And people, you don't see even in the comments when we do a show about like that Vanderbilt nurse that missed a, that accidentally gave vecuronium instead of Versed in a scanner and paralyzed the patient to death in a oh. scanner. I mean, it's the worst way to die. So already you have a second victim effect where yep. the person who made the mistake feels like a murderer. And then second, she was fired, which is not the correct course of action, mm -hmm. and then criminally prosecuted for second degree murder or something by wow. Tennessee, or I forget where it was. Uh, yeah, it was around Vanderbilt, so it would have been Nash uh, Nashville or something. And how, <laughs> when, when we did that story, and I, I advocated for actually a just culture yeah. approach to that, a lot of people in the comments were like, this woman's a murderer and she should hang and she should feel terrible and okay so you want people to actually go into medicine when that's how you're treated when you make a mistake that's crazy who's not a murderer in healthcare if she's a murderer exactly we've yeah. all made yeah. a mistake that's yeah. adversely yeah, yeah. affected patient. except for him because he hasn't, <laughs> hasn't graduated yet <laughs> even though he's uh, been I blamed was, for many mistakes i was a med student at santa clara valley when they were switching from paper to epic and so i'm pretty <sighs> sure you were there when they did that Dude, I used oh. to practice. I used to work at the Valley uh, as a resident. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I had plenty of opportunities uh, during that time period to, to do terrible things you know that what, no one realized. You, yeah. may, you know what made the but Valley? Yeah, it was, oh. The Valley was awesome because it was on paper. So you Thank could go you, yes. there and you oh, could be like, yeah. blah, 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 and you die, and it was great. Now, um, sure, there were probably errors, but I feel like the patients got better care. <laughs> what, was, what was more traumatic? Back to paper, back, back to, to paper. paper. Back. What was more traumatic, watching yeah. the transition to Epic or watching your first baby delivery? Oh, um, uh, <laughs> this is gonna sound. This is gonna sound bad. Oh, like the transition to Epic was just so. Bad. So I, I had a patient who was like in like DKA, like in the ED at Valley, and like, like I basically like ordered like the the, the stuff for him like three times, and like went to check in him, like never got it. And it's because the nurse was like, well, like the patient like doesn't exist in the system. <laughs> and so oh this guy was like, sitting there for like hours, hours of this. Yeah. <laughs> there are new errors that are introduced by electronic yep. medical They're yep. unique errors, yep. and they're systems, and they're preventable errors. Yep. Ordering on the wrong patient, for yep. example. Yep. Constantly. Yeah. I've written notes on the wrong patient. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yep. Yeah. And that's a crime, because that's the billing <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. That, that, that's when it becomes a crime. Yeah, exactly. That's when it's a crime. That's when the administrators <laughs> well, bring you in. Look, we know you've killed several patients through medical errors. Yep. We don't care about that, because the complications keep us in business. <laughs> it's the billing that you screwed up. <laughs> well, well, the thing that I, like, well, uh, the way that I think about, about it sometimes is, like, imagine if a solution like ours that, you know, finds, you know, like, let's say, you know, 5% of the lung cancer patients who have their lesions missed, we find it earlier, it improves outcomes. Uh, think about, like, what the, you know, five-year survival rate improvement would be to patients and how much we could charge for this as a drug if... Oh, ours... wow. Wow. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's like, wait, like, why are the incentives not in the same place here if you can have technology that... So, so. Now you're I think about this like, a lot. Now you're thinking like those <laughs> douchebags in suits at JPM, man. That's good. And you like the TV show Silicon Valley. Uh, it's uh, it's everyone who is you know here. It's it's way too close to home sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Every single yeah. person I've talked to in Silicon Valley who's in tech will not watch that because it's too close to home. And it's funny because I've had these experiences that are fresh out of that show. I mean, just a hundred percent, like people say things to me and I'm like, that's a line from Russ Hanneman or that, you know, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. Or the concert with Flo Rida. <laughs> In the very I've beginning. I've been to several of those during the course of my past two couple companies. Yeah. Have you hit balls at like Pac Bell Park? Or? Yes, I have. Of course you <laughs> yes, have. I yeah. have. Yeah. That's amazing. Have you ever? My investors have had you there. Yes. Yes. To court you and to you know yes. talk about how they want to actually invest. honestly the the main reason was because uh, there were like three years where Google Glass was like the shit and so yeah. we were the Google Glass company I yeah. remember so, that yeah, yeah. Google Glass everyone was talking about the glass holes walking around San Francisco <laughs> yeah. you, you, so and and now here I am I'm like a pariah for trying to talk about medical errors in healthcare so it's the whole other I other love shoot it. <laughs> dude you Keep will going. never 
<laughs> and with my with my crowd, you will never be a pariah. You will be celebrated, and we will advocate for you and fight for you what you're doing because it's unbelievable. And also, I believe you can be your own Jin Yang if you try hard enough. Suck it, Jin Yang. Suck it, Jin Do you see no, when the investor no. gets up at the Flow Rida concert? <laughs> And no one's no one's dancing. No one no, even knows who this guy is. And the head investor goes, I "Want to thank you? There's refreshments in the back, and I want to thank Mr. Mr. Flor Florence, Flo Flor Florida Florid Florid. I want to thank Florid. No idea who this guy is. Yeah. It's the story of the valley. You know, man. Somebody says, "Hey, this is a great idea. I want yeah. to get this at my hospital." Um, they can do what? How do they find you? Uh, shoot me an email. Go to our website, ferrumhealth.com. If you really want to seem hip, ferrum.ai. It's still live. Paylu, uh, <laughs> <laughs> P-E-L-U-F, ferrumhealth.com. Um, and honestly, like we like the, the cool part about what we're doing is like this is a system solution. It's integrated system level, so we don't need to go door to door to doctors, right? We like at Sutter and at Austin or the other site that we're deployed at. We were live in half a day across their entire kind of imaging volume. Wow, so it's low low startup. Yeah, problem. so yeah. plug and play. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, like they can start finding these patients that they're missing every single day, every single week. They could find them tomorrow. Are you so hearing stories of patients whose lives are saved because of your technology? We we have uh, dozens of these narratives now, right? Like mm-hmm. like you mentioned, like uh, some like the, the the grandmother who slipped and fell, uh, you know, like broke her hip, went to the went to the ED, got a pansy T for 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 trauma, and then like had a recurrence of breast cancer that just oh. like n- was not caught because again, mm-hmm. it's not the doctor's fault. <laughs> this 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 person is here for trauma. Like you're not going to spend all your time like pouring through like the hundreds of slices that don't have to do with trauma. And so mm-hmm. all these errors that Makes and then sense. and another type of error is like the ED doc who the last thing they want to deal with is like remembering to schedule a follow up scan in six months for this patient. And like mm. so it's a system, right? Yeah. And so we're seeing, I mean, every single one of our sites has dozens of these stories and it's just like building and building and building. So I love it. I yeah. love it, man. Yeah. This is, this is, I really enjoy it. Creativity, this. Yeah. a young medical student mind. Youth creativity, medicine, business, science, AI, everything. AI. Click all the boxes. This pen has AI in it. It does. It's artificial Sell ink. Me this pen. <laughs> <laughs> Sell me this pen. <laughs> Raise me $10 million Series A with this pen. With this pen. I bet I could do it. I bet I could do it. Oh, man. What a pleasure, Paley. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for, for having uh, us. For yeah. everybody who's watching, I'm going to address the camera for a second. First of all, I want to thank Marty McCary for a week of amazing... It's been awesome. It's so fun, and we got to hang out quite a bit. We got to make fun of JPM. Did you, by yeah. the way, did you see, this is the last little bit, you see the article in Bloomberg, so all the JPM people, all the investors are bitching that San Francisco is full of squalor and homeless people, and it's messing up their game. And so they come here... 10,000 of them descend on the city. They raise the hotel rates to $2,000 a night and $125 an hour for a table at a, at a meeting space in the Marriott. And then they say, I don't understand why it's so filthy. Next time we're gonna do it in Vegas. And these are the people who are sucking the money out of an inefficient healthcare system, out of the wages of the people that are now on the street. And then they have the fucking nerve to come and say, yeah, this place is a shithole. Now, it is a shithole. Don't get me wrong. But like, it's my shithole. But it's my shithole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think the hot new thing now is actually they're doing these, like, you know, private events around JP Morgan before and after, you know, like that are like Napa in Napa now. So yeah, they fly so in, they just go, yeah, they're going to Napa for a few days and they I come, I didn't get come here, hold their nose, and, you know, and then they <laughs> oh go back to Napa afterwards. Oh so it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's really, you know, and you yeah, and me both lived I'm, in the city. You live in the city. Yeah. yeah. And it is true, it's true. San Francisco has huge challenges and it has to do with wealth and equity. And look, you know me, I'm not a communist or some kind of wacko. I'm just saying there's gotta be a way to raise everybody up while not knocking down people who are working very hard like yourself, right? So there are ways to do that. You gotta figure out. You know, if there were two farmers um, in the United States, say 100 years ago or, or 200 years ago, one might work twice as hard as the other, one might make two or three times the other farm, but one farmer does not make 2,000 yeah, times 2, more than the act, next yeah. farm for working relatively exactly. similar we, type of We work. want people to do well for working hard, but we don't want that kind of inequity. So I'll read a few comments on the way out. Ashley says another amazing interview. Meyer Kosla is a doc, great talk, fucking awesome. I like it when my followers talk like I do. <laughs> And uh, Erica Black says, this week of lives has been great, very informative. So I, lo- I love having Marty on the show. I loved having you. 
let's go have lunch or do something fun. And yeah. you guys hit share, subscribe to the show if you want to support us. We're doing a lot of interesting stuff, and we really love that we're free of all this commercial garbage. Uh, and if you're listening on the podcast, just review the damn podcast. People are so lazy. It's like it's like you got to guilt them like NPR. You know, like you are in your car and you're enjoying Terry Gross, but Terry Gross is broke. She's broke as fuck. Help Terry Gross be less broke. So please give us give us some money. Tote bag. <laughs> Hey, awesome or what? He's awesome. Good. And we out. We out. Hit the button, Victoria.